Special thanks to the worship team. That was good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you this morning because you have called for us. You have set aside this day and made it holy. You gave us the Sabbath in the week of creation. From the very beginning in the garden, you chose to spend time with your kids. So, Father, we have come here to seek you back and to find you and to bask in your presence and to hear from you, be recharged, rejuvenated by you, to just be in love with you. And so, Lord, I say again, this is your time. This is your place. These are your people, and this is your day. I am a tool in your belt to be used as you see fit. Lord, use me today. Speak through me today. Talk to us today. And let us be filled with you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's kind of crazy. I say it all the time, but Sabbath is the busiest day for pastors, and yet it's the best day. I don't know how to get past that. It simply is the best day of the week, and you still look forward to it every single time. I'm going to start today with some verses that we're going to go through. And the reason I don't often use the big screen. I grew up in a church that did not have one. I do this for purpose. I grew up in a church where you used to turning the pages of the Bible. When the pastor would say, open up to this scripture, you'd hear pages flipping. And when the pages stopped flipping, we knew as pastors that was when we could start because everybody had found it. We would say things like, if you have it, say amen. And the church would say amen. Or, and if it wasn't loud enough, we'd wait. But we would go through scripture together. And now I'm a person of this generation. I have my electronic devices. And I see us have our electronics. I have my phone, my tablet and my computer here today. All of my devices cued and set up with scriptures and words and passages and Sabbath school lessons on there. But the thing that I find when we go to church is we have become comfortable in our technology. Meaning that we as good Christians will download the Bible app. Oh, we'll download it, but we don't know how to use it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I told you I don't make friends when I'm up here. We'll download it, but we don't know how to bookmark anything like we used to do in our old Bibles. I remember my L.A. Union Bible. I had that thing. Green highlighted was my war scriptures. Yellow highlighted was my feel goods, and my promises were in blue. I remember that Bible. I had it highlighted to death, and then I went and bought tabs. I remember asking my mom, Mom, I need tabs so I can write on the side where the scriptures are found. But we don't do that anymore. We don't know where anything is. I already told you about yourself last week and not reading your Sabbath school lesson. Now we don't know how to use the Bible stuff, so now we're not using our Bibles at all. And that bothers me that we've gotten so comfortable in our technology. So I don't use the big screen much. I'm not into spoon feeding. You're going to have to work. You want to eat? Let's open it up. And so today, I listed the scriptures we're going to go through today because I was very tempted to just read through these passages like one single letter. And what I'm going to talk about today is our focus. What are we focusing on as followers of Christ? There is a lot of stuff out there in the world right now. Just this week, I was sent quite a few things, uh, um, misbehaving pastors. Let's just say that. Uh, you had one pastor, and this is from a year ago, got up in front of his church and told his church that the Bible is not the word of God. It was written by men, and it's complete, full of contradictions. He said that in church. You have a young female who said that if Jesus were alive today, he would have said that showing grace, um, uh, showing love, you know what, I'm not even going to quote it. Let me just tell you that it was something misquoted about that Jesus might have said about abortions, and it didn't sound right. 
You don't, that's not something you talk about from the pulpit. You have people out there mocking God at every turn. I haven't even seen the Olympics opening ceremony, but I heard that there was something that happened in an open ceremony that mocked Jesus Christ. I haven't even seen it yet. I don't have TV. But I got six messages this morning about it. You have people going out asking people if they believe in Jesus Christ, and they are emphatic. They, are, they, they want to be like Peter was when he was denying Jesus Christ. They were cussing. No, I don't believe in him. I'm an atheist. Why would I need God? You have the wheat and the tares beginning to separate because of the fruits. You can see where life is going. And we as Christians, what I find is that sometimes, and I'm not going to say everybody, I'm not going to say all the time, but what I'm saying is collectively, more often than not, what I hear is us discussing the rhetoric of the world instead of discussing what Jesus is doing in our lives today. I know people who know more about actors than they do about biblical heroes. We know more about people whose lives are fake than we do about Jesus Christ and what he's doing for us. And I see a problem in it. We're trying to be like the world. And I understand the need to fit in. Trust me. I grew up this long-armed, big head, unibrow-having kid with big feet, but I was short. My father would take me to the hospital time and time again. What's wrong with my son? Why isn't he growing? It wasn't until my seventh and eighth grade year that I grew into my body, but then my body grew and my head was still small. So all my high school pictures, I got, I look like a oopa loop or something, but like reverse. I'm tall, but I got this little tiny head. Now my head's so big, I can't find a hat. That's okay. I understand not fitting in. Nobody told me I had a unibrow till I was in the 10th grade. Y'all just let me look like Lurch? Y'all just let that happen? Nobody told me nothing. I'm the only kid with size 16 shoes that can't find a size. And now I got 18s and I got to wear boots to come to church because I can't find dress shoes. I understand trying to fit in. But to what purpose? And for what? I don't want to be like the world anymore. I had my time. I don't want to talk about what they're talking about. It goes nowhere. I've ran my life into a brick wall. I did the thing. What I want to discuss is things that edify my family. What I want to discuss is how we're going to break these generational curses with Jesus Christ. What I want to discuss is where we're going from here. Trying to discuss what the world is doing benefits me nothing. I don't want to sit in rooms where we're talking politics. For what? The devil's running the, the whole state capitol building. What am I talking about this for? What I want to talk about is what Jesus is doing. Because the last time that I checked, Daniel was captured and never got to go home, but he still served God the entire time. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to see Daniel. So why am I discussing the kings of this world when the king of kings is coming back for me? It doesn't matter. We have to keep our eyes focused on him and stop focusing on what's happening out there. He can stop that, maul that, release that, live. He can do what he wants with that. What is he doing with me? That's what I'm concerned about. I don't care about the opinions of men sitting in rooms who have no power to do anything when I can talk to the one who has the power to do it all. I don't, it, I don't care for it. And it's not an arrogance thing. It's a save my life thing. It's a Jesus Christ has invited me to come to heaven with him and he has promised to bring my whole family and set this whole mess straight and all of this will fade away and seem like a distant memory. I got to unlearn PTSD of earth. I got to learn what it means to be safe and secure in my father's arms. I got to learn what it means to not have worry, to not have want, to not have need. I'm trying to get focused on what heaven is doing. And yet I see our people, our people. We don't call out wrongs anymore. We ignore them. 
We don't want to get called out by the world for calling out wrongs because we don't want to offend anybody. Do you, do you not remember who Jesus was? He chased people out of his father's house for disrespecting his father. He called his friend the son of the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan, is what he told to Peter. He did not live a life of worrying about offending people. He told somebody in their own house at dinner that what comes out of your mouth is what makes you filthy, not what goes in. Jesus didn't care about being invited back. What he cared about was telling the truth. And I don't want to be like the world. If it's wrong, it's wrong. We have to stand up for it. And I look at my three kids and see the world that they're going to have to inherit. And if I don't stand up for them and stand up for what's right, what am I teaching them? I'm teaching them to be the person who sits in the, the tram, the train, the subway, and watches someone else gets attacked and turns and looks the other way. I'm, seeing, I'm teaching them to be the kind of person who witnesses something is wrong, and when the police come and ask what happened, I ain't no snitch. What am I teaching them? Jesus called me to stand on him, and the last time I checked, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if I'm standing on Jesus Christ, then I got to stand on truth. Or as the young people say, standing on business. Did I say it right? Did I say it right? I'm getting old. I got to make sure I say it right. <clears throat> we have to stand up and be accounted for. And so today I'm going to start in Isaiah 520. Because I want you to hear from the Bible what it sounded like in that time. Because it is eerily reminiscent. You know what? I'm not even going to say eerily. It is definitely what you see today. Right now. We're living it right now. I used to grow up thinking, and I've said this to you before, people would say, we're living in the last days, and it was all older people saying it. And I'd be like, maybe yours. But I'm just getting started. And wait till I get there. And what I have found out is that we're closer to the end than ever before. I can smell it. I can see it. I can taste it. And I'm worried about my children, except when I look at the face of Jesus, he just looks down and says, you worried for what? Stay focused on me. I told you what's going to happen. And I, more importantly, I told you what I was going to do. Stay focused on me. Isaiah. 520 starts off in the entire book. Uh, let's see here. There it is. Isaiah starts off writing very kind words in the beginning. He begins with a parable in the form of a song talking about his beloved and about a vineyard. And it's very quickly you find out that the beloved he's talking about is Jesus Christ and the vineyard is his people. And he's trying to work this vineyard and he sets him on top of a fertile hill and he begins to work the vineyard and he waits for the crop to come out. He waits for his people to rise. He waits for his people to be what they are supposed to be. But what he gets with the first crop is a hot mess. The product is terrible. They're sour. And it makes them useless for making the wine because the, the, let's not forget that the product that we're supposed to be, the sweet product, is to attract other people to come to Jesus. But unfortunately, we have turned sour. Folks don't want to be like Christ anymore. Folks are actively rejecting him. And he said this would happen way back in Isaiah. So then he declares that he's plans to Lay the vineyard to waste. He will remove the hedge, the wall, and allow the animals to come in and eat and destroy the vines. He would not work the ground. He would allow the thorns to take root and grow. He would even direct the clouds not to rain overhead. And then Isaiah reveals from the parable everything that I said before, that he's talking about us. 
He starts talking about the woes that will happen to the people. Woe being translated like, uh uh-oh. Like, ooh. He starts talking about the woes, and the first woe was to buy up your neighbor's fields and houses and make them sure they're distanced from you. And we have that now, even in townhome complexes and apartment buildings. What happens when we go home? We go to our house, we shut down our walls, and we lock down our borders for the day, and we don't interact with anybody. It is amazing to me how many of us, and I said us, do not know our neighbors. And I'm not talking about because you wave to them in the morning as you go to work. How many of us don't know the people around us? How many, this is even better, this is even more telling. How many of them don't know we're Christians? It's amazing to me what has been done. We all want bigger and bigger and better and better and push people further away. And that's not the mission God called us for. He said it would happen. We assume the form of arrogance and greed, which goes beyond simply having a comfortable home. The Lord said, I will bring drought to you. The next woe was to those who drink alcohol and get involved in terrible living. I'll just put it like that. Those addictions that take away from our lives, our family hoods, and take away from any of us having a purpose in life. We're too preoccupied with feasts and music and drinking to pay attention to the Lord. And you get down through the woes, you get down to verse 20. And verse 20 is the one that started me on this journey, this Sabbath, that started me on this place. I was looking at what was happening to the world, and I said, didn't God say something about this? And verse 20 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. My goodness. I have never seen the lines more blurred than they are today. I have never seen more excuses for our bad behavior, more excuses for our decisions, more excuses for this. I have never seen more nonsense than I have today. And we, we are eating it up hook, line, and sinker. I see the divisions in our churches already. What is good? What isn't? What's acceptable in the eyes of the Lord? What isn't? What should we be doing and what shouldn't we be we be doing, what movies we should be watching, what books we should be reading, books that are in our schools that shouldn't be in our schools, what education are we getting, What what are we entertaining ourselves with? I see the lines blurred more now than I ever did before. To now where they're trying to make us think that everything's permissible, that everything is acceptable, that you can do you, be you, you only live once, Do it big, bigger than you've ever done it before. This is what the world is teaching your children. And if we don't take a stand and say negative, no, stop, the line is here. Jesus, I need you to build this wall, be a shield. No, if we don't teach them that because we've bought it and bought into it. Let me get myself in trouble. It's amazing to me how many of us parents allow our children to watch movies like Doctor Strange, a movie about a sorcerer who gets his power from a demon. It's amazing to me how many of us love the Twilight and Harry Potter series and have the entire series in our home, watch the movies on repeat. It's amazing to me the things that we give our children without monitoring what they're doing. We give them cell phones, tablets. We don't put any kind of protection on it. We just throw them to the world. We don't even check. It's amazing to me that how much we've bought into raising our children the way the world raises them and not the way God said raise them. And it says, woe to those who call evil good. It's okay. It's all right. It's all good. And who call good evil. Who put the darkness for the light and the light for the darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Woe. 
It's amazing to me how we act. And so I started there. And I started going down the rabbit hole. And I began to read this like a book. Go to Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to try to walk through this so I don't run out of time. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Paul is teaching here. And he writes a letter to the people in Rome. By the way, it's amazing when you read this letter, you find that it is a very diverse group in Rome. It's a very diverse group. And he wants to come preach because of their diversity. Because there are many people from many places, he wants to come there and preach. But he said, you know, things have happened that have prevented me from coming. But I'm, I want to come because I'd reach out to a lot of folk there. He gets down in the midst of his greeting. He starts teaching on the gospel and the salvation message. It's almost like he can't help himself. And he launches to reveal the purpose of his letter by saying he's not ashamed of the gospel and God is right to condemn humanity for what has happened, what has been done. We have messed this up and we need salvation. He puts that in the letter. Why we need salvation? Because of our own mess, filth, and corruption. Why he is right to say you need help and I'm coming to help you. You can't do this on your own. Stop pushing me out, pushing me away. And so it reads in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even in his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Wow, we make excuses for everything. God says there's no excuse. Everything we do is anti-God. Everything that seems right in our society is anti-God. Do it his way. I said this before and I'll say it again. If you take everything that society says is right and almost turn it on its head, you'll be close to something that resembles godliness. But we have completely turned our culture and our society upside down to where everything that God said is wrong. And everything that we want is right. We say there are excuses, or you can, you can make a reason for anything. And God says there's no excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Tell me if you see this today. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the corrupt, in, uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. We made idols. Wherefore God has shown them up, has gave them up to, clear, to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Uh, I think we've seen that today. I think we've seen that in the people we hold up as heroes. I love Magic Johnson. I got pictures with him. I told you last week. But that does not excuse his behavior of going after women, woman after woman, five, six, seven at a time, while he was married. It doesn't excuse the immorality of what he did. His money and wealth do not excuse what was done. And I was a kid watching this. This was my hero. I quickly realized I got to find a new one. Because that ain't working. Think of the heroes you've had. Why do we put them in the positions that they are, knowing that the people that they are? We have to focus on the one who is incorruptible. It's been proven. His life was lived on this planet, and every demon was focused on one job. Stop 
Jesus Christ. I don't care whatever you do in your spiritual world, stop Jesus Christ. And they couldn't do it. They couldn't even make him think a bad thought. <laughs> yeah, I like it. She get into it. I'm, work, Lord, work. Verse 26. Or verse 25, rather. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to their vile affections. For even their women did not change the natural use into uh, into which is against nature. And likewise did the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned into the, in their lust one, one toward another, men and men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meat. Now I'm not going to say anything about it, else about it, but I heard that at the Olympic opening there was a mockery of Jesus Christ with some drag queens, men dressed as women, for the Last Supper photo. Now, I didn't see it. I don't know. But that was all the phone calls I got this morning. Now, disrespecting God on your own is, uh, that's you. I praise God all the time that he's got a sense of humor. He made me. So I thank him that he's got a sense of humor. But mockery of God has never been allowed to go on in the Bible. And now you're taking... You're making a mockery of God. You're making a mockery of his creation. You're making a mockery of yourself. And you're posting it out there for the world to enjoy. How do you think the father is going to respond? How do you think he should respond? I praise him for his mercy. I praise him for his restraint. He should have flicked this mud ball into the sun a long time ago. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, they that which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasures in them that do them. Tell me you don't see all of that in the world today. In the people leading us, in the people out there trying to tell us what we should believe, what, us, what we should vote for, what, uh, what we should be doing with our schools, what we should be teaching in our homes, how we are to raise our children. These are the people that we are trying to be like, focusing on the same things they're focused on, going the same places they go doing the same things they do, watching the same shows they watch, being entertained by the same thing that entertains them. Why are we trying to be like the people on this list when God says they are worthy of death? We are called to be different and to be set apart in our homes, in our lives, in our speech, in the way we walk, in the way we talk, we're called to be different. And yes, we're going to make mistakes, and I'm going to irritate people, and I'm going to say the wrong thing, and I'm going to be in a bad mood. But that is rarer than it is normal because I walk with God. And every day, I get a little further away from the person that I was and a little closer to the person he wants me to be. It's by his grace, by his grace, that he will see me and mine to the kingdom. I don't want to be like them. I did it already. It's terrible. But I want to be like him. I want to be like him. Go with me to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I'm going to read through these real quick. I'm not going to expound on them at all. We're just going to read through them like a book. First Timothy 1 through 4. Now the spirit 
expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves. Oh, that's, that's say first Timothy. I did say first Timothy. There you go. By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars and conscience are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Let me, I said I wasn't going to spout on this, but I need to real quick. I need to say this. This was written during a time where, where the, the writer Paul was dealing with Gnostics. Gnostics abandoned everything that, that was physical, everything that came from the flesh. And he's trying to tell them that there are things in this world that are still good, but you have to do it the right way. You have to do it God's way. Don't just reject everything because you think it brings you closer to God. No, there are some things that God made for you. The marriage bed was made for you. Enjoy yourselves with God. I wish I would have known to pray over my marriage bed. I wish I would have known to invite, it, invite God to that space. You know, you, anyway, okay. I wish I would have known. God says everything that I made for you is good for you when you use it through me in the way I say to use it. When you go outside of me, you are abusing. And that's not good. Go to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 7 says this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of what is good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers and pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You want it direct? There it is. If they don't act like Jesus Christ, why are you following them? If they don't sound like Jesus Christ, why are you listening to them? Turn away. It doesn't get more direct than that. It doesn't. For this, for of this sort are they which creep into houses. Listen to this. And lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What he's saying here is these are the kind of people who creep into our churches and take my congregation away. They take my people away. Why are you listening to them? Why are you following them? Stop letting them dominate your mind. You come to church one day a week for a couple of hours. We don't preach any longer than 45 minutes. Okay, maybe I do once in a while then, but we don't really preach any longer than 45 minutes. And you compare that to six days of filling your head with other people other than God. Let's finish. Let's finish. Let's finish. John 14, 6. You should know this verse by heart. Jesus answered and said, I am the way. That should be enough. I am the way. The way isn't a direction. The way isn't a thing. The way is a person. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one, not any person, there's not a back door. You can't get in and slide out the back and open the door for your friends to sneak into the movies. Heaven doesn't work like that. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's one way to heaven. There's one way to the Father. And by the way, the objective is him. Because like my children tell me, daddy home is where you are. See, I could have Jesus without heaven. Because wherever Jesus is, is heaven. That's the point that we have to evolve to. Where Jesus is, he's the objective. 
Where's Rebecca at? Not stuff, not things. That doesn't provide happiness. He provides happiness. He is my joy. The objective is him. John 14, 1 through 3. And I probably focus on this verse in my walk with my family more than any other. What are we supposed to do with all this, God? And he says, here's the answer. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. And then he gives you a reason to trust. He gives you a reason to believe. He gives you hope. He says, there are many rooms in my father's house. I would not tell you this if it were not true. I am going there to prepare a place for you. After I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me so you may be where I am. I go back to the beginning. I'm not focused on what they're doing. I'm not focused on what they're saying. I'm not focused on where they're headed. I'm not focused on what they're trying to make me believe or trying to make me think. What I'm focusing on, what I'm asking our churches to focus on, is what he's doing. Where he's at. Focusing on his soon return. Focusing on doing the things he's asked me to do right now in my life today. I ain't got to worry about even tomorrow. I may not make it to tomorrow. He may come tonight. I got to focus on what he's asking me to do right now. And what he's asking me to do right now is stay focused on him. Because he's coming back for his people. He's coming back to take us home. He's coming back to end this mess. He's coming back to put the rebellion down. And the only question that I have for you today is when he comes back, will you be ready? Or will you tell him, I'm sorry, I was focused on the news? Let's pray. Father, these scriptures can be read like a letter to your last day people like a book. You were trying so desperately, you were trying so desperately then to call us out from where we are into the space of where you want us to be. We have lost focus and it has prompted fear on all sides. It has prompted angst on all sides. It has prompted worry on all sides because we stopped looking in your face. And so I call out to you like Peter did walking on water. I call out to you and say, Lord, save us. We cannot save ourselves. I'm asking that you pray for us like you prayed in the upper room for Peter. When you told him that the devil was asking for him. But when he returns, he will strengthen his brothers. I pray, Lord, that you pray for us. That any of us who have been caught up in this mess, any of us who have been taken away, any of our minds that have been plagued and pulled out and pulled away from you, any of our eyes that have lost their focus and lost who we should be looking at, any of us that are looking down and not looking up from whence our help cometh, any of us, Lord, that have been pulled away by the enemy, I'm asking that you save us and return us to your face. This is my prayer, oh God, because I don't want to see not one of my people, not one of the, the ones that you have given to Pastor Gary and myself, not one of our congregation, not one of our friends, not one of our coworkers, not one of our neighbors. I don't want to see not one be told that they have been risen in the second resurrection and not the first. I want all of us to be caught up in the air in the first resurrection and go to the sanctuary together and praise our God together and sit together at the feasts and enjoy eternity with you together. 
Disneyland is so much better with friends. But I will go by myself. Thank you, God. Save us, God. Amen.